Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou katoa, konnichiwa. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute the experience of Christchurch New Zealand to this important recovery forum. As my um, bio shows, I was a member of parliament at the time of the earthquake that devastated Christchurch on February the 22nd, 2011. And I was elected mayor of the city just over two and a half years later. When I stood for election as mayor, I had exactly the same aspirations as this forum does, aspirations for a resilient and sustainable future for the city. I knew that this meant being open to learning from experience, the theme of this forum. We needed to understand what others had been through in responding to and recovering from disaster. Um, and we also needed to um, make sure that we took advantage of international experience, but also avoided mistakes, which meant that we had to know what went well, but also what went wrong. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. I also felt that we owed it to others, especially those who'd come to our aid, to share our lessons learned as well. Lessons learned is a common catchphrase, but as, ever, as I often say, lessons are not learned until they are embedded into practice. Next slide. And that's the heading I've given this slide, which is actually from a 2012 presentation given in Christchurch by Professor David Alexander, then the Chief Senior Scientist at the Global Risk Forum. Essentially, he says that the difference between reducing the risks of disaster or maintaining the vulnerability exposed in the disaster is whether we actually learn, utilise or adopt the lessons of our experience or whether the lessons are registered, archived, forgotten, or worse, ignored. Reviews, inquiries, and reports into a post-disaster recovery cannot be left to gather dust on bookshelves or left as bookmarks in a computer filing system. They need to be well understood and embedded into practice for the future, which is why this forum is so important. Next slide. One of the barriers to learning the lessons of our experience, I think, is the fear of being shown up for getting things wrong. That's why I say when we look back, we must do so not to blame, but to understand, to learn. The government of the day set up the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, a government department accountable to a minister to run the city's recovery. This unfortunately effectively disempowered the council and the communities that make up the city. The image that I've got up on the screen is from the New Zealand Auditor General's report on roles and responsibilities. And it shows just the complexity that was created by this model. The most important lesson for me and well supported by international evidence was the need to strengthen and not to hollow out existing institutions and established networks and relationships. This would have meant that when the time came for the government to sort of pull back its involvement, there would have been a much stronger foundation for the city's future with more resilient local institutions and networks. Um, and instead, when Sarah was disestablished, unfortunately, there was no legacy effect for the council or the communities. But I'm not going to dwell on that. Next slide. I can't emphasise enough the significance of Indigenous peoples and the traditional knowledge they bring to the table. We really do ignore their contribution to our peril. Their ancestors knew the environment much better than the British settlers who came to our part of the world in the 19th century. Wetlands, which had been traditional food gathering areas, were drained for ever increasing urban development. We saw the consequences of that when the earthquake struck with extensive liquefaction and land damage. The earthquake recovery legislation recognised Te Runanga Onaitahu as a strategic partner and that has been a huge step forward. We've learned the importance of Indigenous peoples themselves embedding their spiritual, environmental and cultural values into the recovery objectives from the outset. This is really a lesson for us all. Next slide. My next message is the vital nature of public participation in decision making, and I think Laurie's touched on this as well. Engage, in the, engage the community, it is their recovery after all. After the earthquake, the City Council developed a draft central city recovery plan, which was based on a, on a citywide engagement a community engagement simply called Share an Idea. 
It was a great way of engaging the whole city and reimagining the city centre. More than 10,000 people turned up over a weekend and over 100,000 ideas were submitted through various platforms. It's not surprising the council received an international award for co-creation. Unfortunately, the draft was replaced by a government blueprint, which didn't go out for consultation, so it, there wasn't that feedback loop. However, again, I'm not going to focus on that other than to say there are great examples of when the design absolutely matched the expectations that the community had set. So, next slide. Both of these examples show what happens when we put people before cars. To the left, a bleak pre-earthquake environment reimagined as a riverside market with a pedestrianised street, showing the best of what a partnership between the council and the private sector can offer. And to the right, you can see that we've literally turned to face the river, which is now the focal point of the city centre. What a difference it makes when you listen to the community. Next slide. Every city has a range of community leaders and networks and every local decision maker should already know who they are. They're trusted connections into the wider community and have to be fully integrated into recovery planning and decision making. They should be treated as a critical part of the resilience of the city's social infrastructure in the same way we treat our physical infrastructure. We rely on our buildings, roads and pipes being well maintained and so must our people to people relationships be well maintained as well. They are vital to community well-being, and they are vital for long-term recovery too. I'm using the example here of Project Littleton, a community network based on sustainability. They run a weekly farmer's market, community gardens, events, waste minimisation activities, but most significantly, a time bank where people literally sign up to do things for each other in the community. There are many such leaders and networks in our city. Next slide. What I've also learned in Christchurch is that there will always be emergent leaders in a time of crisis, and we need to be prepared to make them part of the decision-making loop as well. This is Sam Johnson, the face of the Student Volunteer Army, which emerged from the difficulty he had getting involved in the response. Thousands of students responded to his call and mobilised with a farmy army that came in from the country to help clear streets and properties. The SVA remains as the most popular club on the University of, campus, University of Canterbury campus with thousands of members still willing to volunteer to make a difference today. A question I often ask myself is why do we have to wait until a disaster strikes to recognise this capability within our communities. It always comes to the fore after a crisis, so if it's there then, then it's always there. I wonder if it's because in a time of crisis all the silos come down and it's easier to get involved. Maybe we should have the courage to dismantle some of those silos ahead of a crisis, thereby building the community's resilience and capacity to do things for themselves. Next slide. The last issue that I want to raise relates to the fact that with every crisis comes opportunity. In our case, to build resilience to future challenges, especially climate change. We experienced in a matter of seconds the impact of sea level rise predicted over 100 years as land levels dropped in places by more than a metre. This led to an increased vulnerability to flooding. One of my early decisions was to establish a multidisciplinary mayoral task force on flooding, which provided the city with a framework for making decisions on flood protection and mitigation works, including a voluntary buyout scheme for the most vulnerable homes. I've got some images there. The government had already intervened to um, buy out 7,000 homes or so, clearing a 600 hectare area of low-lying low a land adjacent to one of our rivers, and this has made us much more resilient to, to flooding and given us the opportunity to plant wetland areas, protect biodiversity, manage stormwater and improve water quality. And I've got pictures there of young people getting involved in um, understanding why it's important to protect our waterways. Next slide. 
I'm finishing with this slide because this quote, which many of you will know, was adopted as a motto by another emergent community group, the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Network. It reflects their frustration at being utterly ignored by decision makers. The wisdom of the community always exceeds the knowledge of the expert is what it reads. When communities are left out, the response is to pit one against the other. This does not help long-term recovery. That's why I prefer to say, and um, there's another little bit here, the wisdom of the community when combined with the knowledge of the experts always exceeds what one can offer without the other. Um, it's a simple reminder to us all that we need to work together collaboratively, and that's again picking up on what Laurie said, collaboration. That's what we need to secure a successful long-term recovery. I look forward to discussing this and other issues raised by the panellists um, with you. Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu.